Hey everyone, good evening. I'm Maria Hinojosa, proud Mexican immigrant, proud American citizen, proud Chicagoan, and proud New Yorker. And right now, I'm in my home studio here in Harlem, and I'm sending so much love because it's great to have this kind of a conversation. I'm really, truly honored to be able to be speaking with Gabby, with Ella, and with Samer. I don't know if you know me, I'm the founder of Futuro Media. I'm the anchor and executive producer of Latino USA and in the thick, I'm the co-anchor. And I just wrote a book called Once I Was You, A Memoir of Love and Hate in a Tour in America. I think one of the most beautiful experiences about writing the book actually was finding myself in so many others. So I see myself in Gabby and in Ella and in Samer, even though we're totally different and of a little bit of different generations. But I see myself in them. And what we're all trying to do desperately is to change the narrative around immigration and refugees. I think what's really hard about this moment is feeling like that's still the essential work that we're doing. And that's why um, it's really going to be wonderful to be hearing from these three people about the role that NIJC played in their lives. So let's start with you, actually, Samer. Your story is really fascinating, and I'm just wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about, you know, what happened when you didn't have any like legal representation and you were kind of trying to figure it out after, you know, quite a amount of tumultuous movement in your own life. I was told at the United States Embassy in Caracas to get a Spanish-speaking dictionary and to learn Spanish and good luck. And that was it. That's all the embassy in Caracas told me. And this is a person who, while I was born in Venezuela, I moved out of the country when I was three years old. And for them to tell me, you know, get a dictionary, good luck, bye. Um, it was probably the most demoralizing thing I've ever heard in my life. So when NIJC reached out to me and they told me they wanted to represent me and help me, and for me, it was like, it was like a glass of water when you, when you walk up a mountain and all you want is that, that first, you know, that first sip that punches your thirst. That's exactly how it felt. It felt so refreshing. It was the difference between dying in Venezuela, not knowing anyone and living in America and now thriving. Gabby, what about you? I mean, you had a sense of, again, what was possible in terms of the law in this country or what we think that the law is there to defend us. Yes. But if you don't have a lawyer and you're in a legal situation, it can feel so lonely. So what was it like for you before you had that legal representation and then once you got it? Well, when I came here, I started school, but at the time... I didn't have papers, so I was thinking, how am I going to do it? What if I graduate and I still don't have papers? Am I going to be able to go to college and seek an education? Or what's going to happen? It was hard for me to know that I didn't have any hopes of getting anything better than just high school. So when I got a hold of NIJC and they helped us and they were able to get a residency for us, it was great. I, was, I, didn't, I didn't feel helpless anymore. I knew that I wanted to do something and that I, now I have the possibility to do it. Ella, uh, fellow journalist, uh, it's an honor to meet you. Thank you for all of your work that you've done. Tell us a little bit about for you what it meant to be seen by a legal team like the one at NAJC. When I moved to this country, I I had zero idea what I would do next. Like I just moved. I wanted to escape. It was such a big surprise, you know, like that somebody so so big as NIJC could, you know, care about me, care about a person like from small country and I mean there in this country there are so many like thousands and thousands of people who need help and you know, like I never dreamt like somebody would, you know, consider that my life was a danger and you know, it was I really feel privileged and blessed. <laughs> That's what I feel. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about feeling secure. How do you process feeling safe? So what I think of secure, I think of 
what it means to have a home. Like I've never really had a home before, like a safe space where I can be myself. And now that I'm 30 years old, this is the first time I can actually afford like my own place. But do I feel secure? Um, to a sense, to a sense. I feel secure up to a point, but I feel like that security is so fragile and it is so fleeting and it can like be taken away from us at any minute. So I feel like while I have the foundations of security, we must continue to fight in order to uh, to help secure um, that safety for millions of others just like us in this country and in the world. It's been all, all, uh, less than two years since I, I've arrived to the United States, but still, you know, for me it was like a whole new um, chapter in my life and I started everything from, from scratch without anything and you know, I never felt so vulnerable, but right now I feel safe, safer, much, much safer. And I, as I said, it's my favorite word to say about the whole thing happening here. Like, I feel like I'm blessed. It feels better knowing that you are a legal resident and that even if people don't agree with you being here, there's nothing they can do. They can't kick you out. They can't uh, discriminate you. So I feel like that's a big help. That's what I feel like makes it safer with now being a legal resident. I am a professor. First, I was at DePaul in Chicago. Love Chicago. Now I'm here at Barnard across the street from Columbia University, where I went to school. And I start my classes by asking my students, many of whom are also immigrants, refugees, first generation, what is their biggest, craziest, wildest dream? So I want to ask you that. Samer, let's start with you. Crazy, wildest dream, what would it be? My, for me, my craziest, wild dream is for everyone in this world to be treated in an equal manner as every other human being around them. My craziest, wild dream is to, is, to, is to represent and give a voice and to fight for people that feel like they've been cast in the shadows all their life. All my life I've been told no, and I just want to remind people that all it takes is one yes. All it takes is one yes in your life to change all the other no's around. So my craziest wild dream is to fight for people, is to give hope for people because people fought for me and I want to fight for them. My country is really famous for gun violence. So when I was in there, I suffered from that. So I want to go back one day, but at the moment it seems unlikely. So I hope that in the future, my country becomes better and that everyone feels safe. And I could go back and just enjoy visiting and going to the beaches or doing something like that without having any fear that something might happen to me. That's one of my dreams. The, my craziest dream, and sometimes I really dream about crazy stuff, but I, I always um, kind of connected to my country, to Kyrgyzstan. Like, um, I could see myself there, but I cannot step from the airport. I wish I could just, you know, feel free all the time and do whatever I wanted to do to help all the women in my country, but without feeling fear, you know, just, just being myself and not hiding from anybody. I agree with you. Let me tell you, as somebody who's been around the block a little while, uh -huh. you never give up is all I'm saying. Just never give up. And that's, again, what the three of you symbolize to me is that you never gave up. And I think about now each of you having community as a central part of who you are. So let's talk about that for a moment. When I say, what is your comunidad now, your community now? What is it? What does it look like? It's nothing in a specific. I just feel like everyone around me, like people that are close to me, no matter who they are, if I'm able to help them, I feel like they're part of my community if they're around and I'm able to help. I, if I can help, I feel good about it. I, I feel that I'm being helpful to the community. Okay, that's the best answer of all. I would just throw on, can we also have backyard with pupusas? I'm oh, just saying. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That, that that's just something that I would need because I'm so close to La Comunidad Salvadoreña and, you know, esa comunidad es amor and also pupusas. Okay, now I have yeah. to go eat a pupusa. Uh, pupusa Samer, <laughs> what's, uh, <laughs> what's, uh, 
what is your sense, Samer, of community for you and what community does for you? And, you know, you're, you want to, you want to run for office. It's, I mean, that's not small community. That's big community. You know, I don't really have that blood family. That blood family doesn't exist in my life. Uh, so I've had to find my community. And thank God I have it. My community are other immigrants just like me. The vast majority of my friends are people that have grew up also in the shadows. Ella, community for you. I know it's so important. Um, yeah, talk, <laughs> talk to us about it. I have a few friends right now and... They're, they've become my chosen family. I just feel like they treat me equally. Well, all I can say is that I am so proud to be part of your family. And I know that this country is going to be the better because of the three of you. So you make me feel pretty happy about the future. It's not going to be easy. But nothing is. The passion is what's going to move you. It's going to help you to understand your mission. And all of you are very clear. So I'm super honored to have had a chance to meet with you.